Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 24, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule, and I am humbled by your presence. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, lots to talk about there, and I'm going to get into the winter is coming speech or continue that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. Just hold off on questions that aren't related to the slides, if you don't mind, until we get through the slides, and then hold off on your stock picks until we get to the charts. And this is for your benefit. You can ask about as many stocks as you want. I welcome that. But after you ask about a stock, just put the ticker in, hit enter, and that way I know whether I've talked about your stock or not. So what do we talk about? Well, something that's been in my head lately is failing to win, becoming a successful trader by accepting risk. And that's kind of a working title to that. And I knew I'd have this radio show today that would come into the show and, and I would have less and less time to work on my slides. So I started my slides a day or two ago. And this morning I kind of woke up, I woke up. I wasn't overwhelmed, but I was looking at the, the brainstorm of a, of a mind map that I made for it. And I had so many thoughts. It made me realize that it's going to be tough to cover everything that needs to be covered in just one session. But that's good. This will give us fodder for additional setup sessions. So this is part one of many. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, so let's talk about failing to win, becoming a successful trader by accepting risk. Well, trading involves risk. Now, I know there's a big duh implied, but I poked around the net a little bit to define a, to get a good definition of risk. And I thought that Merriam-Webster had a pretty good one, especially as it relates to trading. And they define risk as a possibility of loss or injury. And if you think about it, risk by definition means there's a potential to fail. So that means that trading has the potential to fail. Now, I know I'm not saying anything that's earth-shattering here. But what's interesting is if you start studying failures, it becomes pretty amazing, especially successful failures, obviously. Babe Ruth struck out 1,330 times, and he held that record for 30 years. And here's one I learned just yesterday. Dyson failed 5,127 times to perfect the vacuum cleaner. And by the way, he's worth between four and five billion. And then, of course, we all know that Edison failed 10,000 times perfecting the light bulb. He didn't invent the light bulb, which is kind of an interesting thing. Like Dyson didn't invent the vacuum cleaner. I'm a big fan of Dr. Seuss. If you haven't read Oh, the Places You Will Go, it's one of the top books ever written on trading psychology. And in the book, he said, I'm sorry to say, but sadly, it's true that bang ups and hang ups can happen to you. By the way, Dr. Seuss rejected 27 times by publishers. So, right before we got started, I got to thinking, how can we completely avoid failure? I have an answer to that. Just never attempt anything. Am I right? Stephen Wright once said, eagles may soar, but weasels don't get sucked into jet engines. 
So if you don't want to fail, don't try. Don't do anything. Getting back to Mr. Ruth, never let the fear of striking out get in your way. And then, of course, Thomas Edison, I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Now, getting back to trading, there's obviously a risk involved with trading. Okay, Again, don't imply. But there's two forms of risk. Obviously, there's a monetary risk, and this could be fairly well defined. Now, of course, something bad can always happen in the markets. But if you're risking 2% of your count, usually, if you get stopped out, that's the worst you can do. And possibly, sometimes, the market moves a little in your favor, and you can improve upon that. But if you have a loss, it can be fairly well defined. So that's a monetary risk. But there's another risk that comes with trading, and that's a psychological risk, another risk that comes with a loss. And I got this from Douglas. I get a lot of my inspiration from Douglas, Mark Douglas, the late great Mark Douglas. And he once said, when you have a loss on a trade, it's not that loss in and of itself. It's the loss, the feeling of losses that you've had on any other trade you've ever made. So it becomes much bigger than it really is. And, and I often give the example of being a parent and dealing with a millennial child. And to the outsider, you snap and you look like you're crazy. And case in point, last Friday night, last Thursday night, I should say, my daughter asked us if she could go to this big party. And it was like the mother of all parties for the year. And Marcy and I, my wife, Marcy, and I were talking was like, damn, that sounds like fun. I wish I could go. It was that much. It was going to be that big of a deal. And later that night, the dogs needed water. And my wife said, Isabel, give the dogs some water. And she's like, oh, I'll get around to it later. And she's like, well, if you don't give them water, you're not going to that party. Okay, no problem. Well, she didn't give them water. We took away the party. Well, the outsider looking in thinks we're kind of irate because the crime didn't fit the punishment. But our frustration was every other time over the past several years that we asked her to give the dogs water and the dogs have gone without water. So that applies Throughout life, sometimes you might snap at your spouse, and it's not that one little tiny thing. It's everything that happened prior to that. So trading is no different in that aspect. When you have a loss, you're not feeling just the pain of that loss. You're feeling the loss, the pain of all losses prior. So there is a psychological risk that comes with a loss. Now, I want to make a case, and it's based on a story that Dr. Robert Marr told in Mastering Fear. And he proposed the question, is rejection painful? And by the way, I would suggest you read this book. I'm not quite done with it. I'm more interested in what he had to say in the front of the book. But as I get to the back of the book, there there are some interesting things there too, but he goes into a lot of talk about the amygdala and keeping it as calm as possible. A lot of, along the lines, of a lot of things off and say like, "Don't wake the panic monster" and all. But he told an interesting story. He asked in his speeches, he says, "Is the is rejection being rejected painful?" And of course, everybody says yes. Well, he tells a story. It's like, okay, well, let's say Bob, and I think he was referring to himself sees a pretty girl and walks up to her and says, hey, uh, would you like to go out Saturday night? And she says, oh, uh, geez, I'd love to, but Saturday nights are reserved for flossing. Now, 
Bob walks away and he thinks, well, geez, that didn't go so well. But you know what? You tried. And that was awesome that you tried. Maybe next time I'm going to tweak my approach a little bit. But boy, I, I, I'm pretty excited that I was able to actually approach a pretty girl. So, man, I'm, I'm just pumped up. Now, the other reaction could have been, oh, I'm such a loser. Nobody will ever want to be with me. I'm just a failure. I don't know why I even tried. I'm never going to try again. So, obviously, the perception of rejection creates the pain or lack thereof. Now, stay with me. I have a point. So this got me to thinking that there's nothing to fear in the markets. So I have a question for you. How stressful was the 2016-2017 bear market in Coca? Did that stress anyone here out? Were there any fears? Did you get, was there any, no stress for me? Okay, good. Donald says there was no stress at all. Well, let's take a look at that bear market. As you can see, that was a pretty serious bear market. Well, why wasn't there stress for the majority of you? Because the majority of you probably don't trade cocoa. I have traded cocoa before. It's like beating your head against the wall. It feels so good when you stop. <laughs> but I digress. Well, the reason is because you have no emotional attachment to it. So the point I'm trying to make here is that markets have zero inherent risk involved. It's your perception of the risk that matter. So a market cannot create pain or fear that is created from within. Just like I often say, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. But once real money is on the line, the fear, the greed, the emotions comes into play. Now, as I often talk about to a point of maybe ad nauseum and but this was a good a good lesson for me to help me wrap around wrap my head around things it's like i i'm not immune to these fears and struggles and frustrations and i drop f-bombs often not as many as i used to but i still drop quite a few i've dropped a few this week so far but I find myself being more and more cognizant of these emotions. Well, one thing that helped me to wrap my head around these emotions was a speech by Denise Shaw, and she was referencing some of the work from Damasio, at least in part, where she proved that you cannot make a decision without emotions. All your decisions have to go through that emotional part of your brain, the limbic system, the amygdala. It has to be processed through that. And I talk about that quite often. So you're going to have emotions. That's a given. That's with any decision, even what you're going to have for lunch today. I've been dieting lately for a few months, and I've been pretty successful with it so far. And man, I really want to go get some fried catfish for lunch. But I know that there's going to be an emotional attachment to that. I'm going to be bummed out tomorrow when I weigh in if you eat the catfish. So with any decision comes emotion. So if you brace and accept that, that's important. Now, so you can't eliminate the emotions, but if there's fear, then we haven't fully accepted the consequences of our decision. Or... There's something we need to know to make decision, better decisions in the first place. Mark Douglas said, and this was either in uh, a Tellerate tape, which no, Tellerate no longer exists. Uh, it, it, it's become 
Traders Expo, but I went to a conference in either late 80s, early 90s. I guess it was early 90s. And I ended up with one of his tapes after the conference, cassette tape, believe it or not. This this little thing that has little actual tape in it. I don't know if you guys are old enough to know what that is. I'm dating myself. I need to find that tape because it's really a very interesting tape. I've transcribed most of it, and I have it written into a notebook here. But on that tape, he said, what you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do when you need to do it without hesitation. So this sort of brings us back to experience and confidence in your methodology. And as you can see, if I'm not careful, I can go off on a lot of tangents here. But you have to reach a point where you have confidence and realize that sometimes it happens. Shit happens. Let's just say let's just spell it out here. <laughs> and sometimes you lose on a trade. So I think Douglas went on to say, and this might have been in the disciplined trader, you don't need to fear the market, but you need to trust yourself. You need to acquire the mindset that you will always act in your own best interests and always maintain, maintain an objective state of mind. When you trust yourself, there will be no fear. Now, one thing I was thinking about, and I didn't have enough time to get it all into this presentation, and maybe this will be part two of many, but once you become confident in what you're doing, you should have, I would say, 90% of the time, you should have a plan in place and you should know 90% of the time what you need to do. And knowing what to do goes a long ways. And if you don't do what you need to do, then there's obviously a disconnect. And in the radio interview a few minutes ago, we got to talking about a trading journal. And I think it's probably as important that you keep an emotional journal. And when you do that post-mortem, you need to look at the process and whether or not you followed the process. Now, in some of these books, and I think Douglas mentioned it too, it's like you have to, they expect that you reach a point where you know what to do at all times. Well, I couched that back or, or brought that back a little bit to 90% because there will be times where you don't really know what to do, or at least you feel that initial frustration and fear and aggravation, like you're not sure what to do. And the way I get myself through that situation, this kind of goes back to the Anthony Robbins motivational type of stuff. I'll give him credit for it. It's probably where I heard it. But you have to ask yourself, if I didn't, I don't know what to do. But if I did know what to do, what would I do? So let me say that again when I'm botching if possible. I don't know what to do, but if I did know what to do, what would I do? And that answer will come to you. And if it doesn't come to you, then just do something. Do what you think should be done or to your best ability, okay? So obviously, if something's going strongly against you, you know you need to get out, provided it's blue pass and stop, blown pass and stop. But if you feel frozen and you don't know what to do, it's like, well, if I knew what to do, what would I do? Well, get out <laughs> and say, well, I'm not really sure. And that doubt starts seeping in. Then you just say, well, let me just let me just take action here and get out. So obviously, if you're going to trade, there will be blood which was obviously a really bad movie. Anyone in here like the movie? <laughs> it's horrible. It was horrible. I remember when it came out, I was I had a business partner once and he's like, I watched some horrible movie. It was it was horrible. It's like it was just depressing. It's like there will be blood. It's like, yeah, that's what it was. Anyway, but there will be blood. So, you need to plan for failure. And as I was Putting a slide together, I start to think, wait a minute, that sounds 
kind of negative, so I added to it, not plan to fail. So along the lines of things possibly not working out, you have to ask yourself, where would you be wrong as a trend follower? And by the way, that was one of my epiphanies a while back because I couldn't wrap my head around why people don't plan ahead of time. And I went for a walk around the block and I was thinking about that and then it just kind of hit me. People don't plan ahead of time because the moment you plan is the moment that you have to admit that you could fail. You have to find out, you have to figure out, I should say, where you should place that protective stop if you are wrong. So that means you have to put a little bit of doubt that it might not work. And a lot of people don't want to admit they could be wrong. And uh, one thing that I've been studying lately, and it was based on a book written by Larry Williams' son, and I think the book is called The Mental Edge in Trading. And he talks about taking a personality test. And I took a, I didn't take an official one. I'm still looking to find an official one to take or for some reason I feel like I need to pay for one to get it done right. But I found one on the internet by some educational university or something and I took it and it does reveal a lot. And I found out that I'm not a very agreeable person. Now I, I, I scored off the charts an extra version, other, I guess I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be on radio, I used to be on TV a while back a few times, I wouldn't be on the internet, I guess I wouldn't be such a ham, you know, I wouldn't be traveling the world speaking, blah, blah, blah. I'm not bragging, it's just what I like to do, okay? But I also scored very low in agreeability, so that means I like to be right. So that's probably, you'll probably see some of that research long lines of personality and revealing a lot about yourself and helping you in that self-discovery process. So the fact that I scored so low in agreeability reaffirms the fact that I like to be right and reaffirms the fact that it's hard for me to accept being wrong in the market. And that explains the amount of F-bombs that I drop. But if you can plan ahead of time and be a little antiseptic, you can say, well, you know what? I know where I'm wrong, and I'm just going to get out, and I'm going to look for something else to do. Now, this is just one of many examples, but let's say you're trading a transitional pattern, okay? And the market's in a longer-term downtrend. Let's see if we can get my pen to work this week. So I don't have it shown here, but just assume this market's in a long, long-term downtrend. And then it has this sharp recovery from lows. Let's say it makes an all-time low and just goes rocketing off that low, pulls back a little bit. Well, that's what I call a first thrust pattern. The Russell 2000 has a similar pattern to this on the downside, obviously along with the bow tie. Well, usually a lot of times a bow tie will also form right around the same time. So this could also be a bow tie pattern. So I think I have a new trend emerging. I get pretty excited because I'm going to get into a new trend early and this trend might go up 100, 200, 300, 400%. Pretty excited about everything. So if I have an entry off that first thrust and it triggers I have to ask myself, and I do this planning before getting in, where would I be wrong? Well, obviously, if it goes down to near the old lows, and in some cases, I'll actually put a stop below the old lows, depending on how far away it is. And I know that if it goes there, then possibly this longer-term downtrend is resuming, and I am 
Wrong. Now on the on the upside, one thing I do like to do, I'm not a big fan of trading efficient markets. But if I have one thing I do like is I've been trading for a while now. I've been trading hourly bow ties and forex off of like major, major highs, like weekly, monthly, huge, maybe all time or multi year highs and look for a weekly bow tie. And on the hourly chart, let's say I get a, a setup and you know, you got a little bow tie or whatever, and I take the setup. Well, I know that if that market rallies up and makes new highs, I am wrong. Okay. Now, I'd be pretty far away, and you probably wouldn't want to have a stop that far away, but let's say you shorted the Russell 2000, which we'll look at in one second on that bow tie. Obviously, if it goes on to make new highs, you're wrong. So you have to admit that you could be wrong and have a place where you're willing to get out. And I know right now I'm preaching to the choir a little bit to most of most everyone here. So you have to accept and you have to embrace that risk. If you, and I know easier said than done, haha, but if you are stressed out in your trades and trading, then you have not fully accepted the risk. What amazes me is you probably won't see it today because I'm giving you a heads up and a warning ahead of time, but in virtually every webinar I've been in, and lately, I've been poking around social media a little bit. I have a business page on Facebook, and I also have my personal page. And I would invite you to become my friend on both. Like my business page and be my friend. And I haven't quite filled up on friends yet, so we got a few, few left. But anyway, in webinars and on social media, I see this quite a lot. I'm long X, Y, Z. What should I do? I did a webinar last night. Somebody asked that exact question. Well, my answer is always the same. What's your plan? Have you accepted the risk of the trade? Obviously not. And I'm not trying not to beat people up too much, but I say, okay, well, you obviously didn't have a plan on this trade. But on your next trade, you need to ask yourself, where would you be wrong and be willing to accept that risk if you're wrong now money management is crucial but it helps obviously not to lose in the first place so you want to pick the best and leave the rest so a good offense goes a long long ways and i have to be careful because Trading doesn't exist in a vacuum. The three parts of trading, the money management, the methodology, and the mind, they're all intertwined like a three-stranded cord, pun intended. And if I start talking about psychology, I ended up talking about methodology, I start talking about methodology, I start talking about money management. So... And as you can see, I was started off talking about trade psychology, got into money management, and now we come back to the methodology. So you need to be picking the best stocks to begin with. Right now, for instance, I've been super duper selective. And the stocks are somewhat speculative that I'm going after. They usually are always speculative, but these are, well, these are extra speculative. IPO and I think one's a Chinese stock. I think even if the market falters more than it has been lately, that they still have potential. So you have to be very, very selective in what you're doing. It's okay not to do anything. And that's hard for successful people. And that's a whole other conversation in and of itself. As I've mentioned before, Back in my computer science days when the earth was still cooling, I learned early on there was an upperclassman that said garbage in, garbage out. So whatever you put in to the computer is going to come out. If you put in garbage, you're going to get garbage out. And the same thing goes for trading. 
And that's why I often say that Papa John would probably be a good trader because he believes in better ingredients, better pizza. I haven't had a Papa John pizza in a long time. I don't know if they're still good pizzas, but or if they're good pizzas to begin with. But that goes a long way. So when you're trying to figure out the, the, the trading puzzle, make sure you're picking the best and leaving the rest. I know that's cliche. But then know where you could be wrong. And make sure you have fully accepted that risk. Now, again, shit happens, okay? But a loss is not, and I slipped in always at the last moment, a failure. In my psychology search, I have started going back in and reading the classics or vintage books. And one of my favorites is Viewpoints of a Commodity Trader. And I forget the author, but if you Google it, it's it's been around forever. And it's amazing when you start reading these things, it's like it, there's two reasons why I'm reading them. One, because there's a lot of good wisdom from back then. Obviously, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator by Jesse Livermore or um, whatever his pen name was. Edwin Lefer, Levy, whatever. But it's Jesse Livermore is a good one. But the reason I'm reading him is because the obvious, there's a lot of good thought back there. And two, I want to give credit where credit is due to these things that I talk about from a psychological perspective, even if I've experienced them myself. And what's amazing, me, amazing to me is a lot of these things are not original thought. I'm not taking away from anyone who's written about in more recent times, it's just amazing me that you can go back 50, 60, 70 years in some of these books and read about things that you read about today. And that's probably because human nature never changes. And I'll put together a bibliography. I don't know when it'll ever happen, but one day I'm going to do a major course in psychology, and this is where this current research is coming from. And I'll put together a bibliography, but there's there's some uh, obscure sources that are pretty good. Like, for instance, I'm totally not a GAN guy, and I, I, I just don't – I think it's an arcane method. I think it's a bad thing to do. I know Mr. GAN ended up dying broke, according to his family members. And not to take anything away from him, I'm sure he was a pretty good researcher. But how to make profits in commodities, the first 20 pages of that book are pretty damn good when it comes to trading psychology. So those are three for you to read really quickly uh, off the top of my head. How to make profits in commodities by GANs. Again, don't try to read the whole book. You'll get lost and you'll get into a lot of trouble. But read what he has to say about psychology, read Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, and read Viewpoints of a Commodity Trader. You can read Viewpoints probably in one setting. It's a quick read. It's a pretty good little book. It really is. Now, one thing that was said, I know I digressed, but that's typical. <laughs> one thing that was said in Viewpoints that makes a lot of sense, and it's something that I want to flesh out a little further, but he said sometimes the market can make a mistake. And that kind of makes you feel a little bit better because sometimes, I, sometimes I'll do everything right and have a perfect setup and a perfect trade and still lose money. Well, as Douglas said, all it takes is one hell to screw up a perfectly good trade, and that's true. And there's a lot of extraneous things that have nothing to do with the market that could affect the market and take you out of position. But in viewpoints, he said, sometimes a market can make a mistake. And I just thought that was pretty interesting. So it's yet another way or another reason you have to accept a reason that you have to give up control and be willing to accept giving out the giving up control. Now, 
I think one of the best things in the world that you could do, and this comes along the line of deliberate practice, and this is a big part of deliberate practice. If you want to get better at something, you really have to not only practice, but you have to exercise deliberate practice. You have to work hard at getting better at what you do. And one of the best ways of doing that is to do an honest post-mortem. And it's hard. That's why you have to be brutally honest when you do this post-mortem. And you really have to say, did I really pick the best and leave the rest? Now, this will be in hindsight, but that's okay. As I say ad nauseum, many times you'll look back at a trade and say, what the hell was I thinking? But that's okay. At least you're learning something. You'll say, well, geez, this thing was really choppy. The sector action wasn't there. The market overall was questionable. Other stocks within the sector didn't look so hot. And then sometimes you might look at it and say, well, you know, I look pretty good. But now that I'm looking at the sector, there were a lot of other stocks that looked a heck of a lot better. Now, you need to do this whether you win, whether you lose, or whether you draw. Whether you draw. Sometimes you might find yourself saying, geez, this really wasn't that great of a trade. I made a lot of money on it, but I realized that that was just luck. And that's another thing, by the way, and I think I read this in, I think this was in, uh, I don't have the name of the book in front of me. It's something I found out that's in public domain. I'm doing a, I've been on a, a, a hunt for these old vintage books that have a lot to do with trading psychology. And it has trading psychology in its name, and I'll have to find a name for you. But in more recent texts, and these behavioral finance type of texts, they talk a lot about how a man attributes his winnings to skill and his losings to bad luck. And that was written, this book was probably written in 1929 or something. I'm reading this in this modern text, and it makes me realize this is not an original thought. Somebody discovered that a long time ago. So you got to be really careful if you do something stupid. I did something stupid once and made some money. And a hedge fund guy said, boy, you really picked up nickels in front of that bulldozer. <laughs> and he's right. You know, it, you have to recognize that what you're doing is the wrong thing, even though you made money. And that can be hard. So a loss is not a loss, and I think this was in Viewpoints and Livermore and every other book out there, as long as something can be learned. I don't know if you can hear it or not, but Donald, when Donald hears me talking, he wants to come see what's going on. Donald's out there crowing. So always ask yourself, is there something to be learned from the trade? And I have to be careful because if I'm if I'm not careful, everything I do will just sound like reminiscence of a stock operator. So I did I couldn't resist it this, this morning. I flipped it open because I knew the quote I was looking for. And this is what came out. And this is what I found. If a man didn't make mistakes, he'd own the world in a month. But if he didn't profit by his mistakes, he wouldn't own a blessed thing. So the post-mortem could be a, a wonderful process. If you just did one thing to greatly improve your trading, it would be the post-mortem. All right. Any questions that I get a little too far out there or whatever? <laughs> I'd be crowing too if you named me after a duck. No, he's named after Donald Trump because he looks like Donald Trump. Let me see if we could find him real quick. Let me show you a picture of Donald. All right. Any questions on any of that? Let's see if we can get him. Uh... All right. Let me see if I can. I'm trying to do this on the fly. Well, it's opening in my paint program.
anyway, this is what uh, this is what Donald looks like. Let me see if I can get it over here. That's what Donald looks like. So that's why that's why his name Donald. All right. Before I digress too far, I know too late. Lately, I've been talking about the fact that winter is coming. And that bastard Jon Snow has been saying this for a long, long time. By the way, I was probably the last, as I wrote a while back, I'm probably the last person to watch Game of Thrones, but now I'm all in. And uh, was it just me or did everyone else think, yeah, right, when the, when the dragon's eyes went to blue, you know? <laughs> so lately, for the last couple of weeks, we've had some signs that we could, and could is a key word in that sentence, could be entering a bear market phase. Now, when we get to the live charts, I'm going to update you on some of these things, and we'll take a look at it, and we'll see how it's developing. And I'm not sure of my timing in this, and I'm not saying this could happen tomorrow. What I am saying is markets go up and markets go down, and it seems like we're losing a little steam in here, okay? And we'll take a look at the sectors and signals, etc. And I hope, and I know you should never use the word hope in this business, but I hope that this is just another correction along the way. My life is a lot easier in a bull market. It's a lot easier to trade a bull market. I could trade a bear market and I could do just fine. I don't get rich in a bear market because the short covering rallies are tough, but I could stay out the way on the long side and possibly buy commodities if they're set up, commodity-related stocks mostly. But it's painful because it's hard, and it's even harder on my clients because they don't short. So I do have a little bit of fear, since we're talking so much about fear, that we could be entering a bear market. And along those lines, I've been thinking, well, Dave, what do you do? Because I'm kind of worried that we could have this bear market. Like, well, nothing. Just see what tomorrow brings. See what the day after tomorrow brings. One thing that has me concerned, and this is one of those non-quantifiable things that I've been talking about lately. And if you've been around long enough, you kind of get a feel for these kind of things. Hard to quantify, but important nonetheless. So we had a big rally day before yesterday, and I noticed somebody posted this on Facebook, and I couldn't help myself. I had to answer him. Bear meat is so friggin' tasty. Any more sellers in the market for us to slaughter? Oh, geez. You know, when you start publicly bragging, what's the saying? Pride goeth before the fall. So I could, I had to respond. I said, well, let's not start kissing each other just yet. And then he replied, and I don't want to pick on him too much, but he replied with his system for beating this market. And it had some flaws in it, but I didn't want to argue with him publicly because experience is the best teacher. What's the old saying? A man convinced of his will is of the same belief still. And he was bragging that his little VIX-related system, which, again, I think is flawed, has worked 100% of the time so far this year. Well, very hard for me to say that'll work. <laughs> very, very hard for me not to say that'll work until it don't. So there's a complacency out there. Also, it seems like a lot of people are quick to point out that this is yet just another correction. Stay calm. Don't panic. And we're going to look at that. And so far, in some cases, maybe it is just another correction. There's a lot to suggest that. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on that, okay? And it's better to be safe than sorry. 
And as I said last few weeks, we've had quite a few debacle du jours. And if you look at a couple thousand stocks every night like I do, which I recommend you do, that and the postmortem, two of the probably most important things you can do to get better at the markets. Good morning, Aaron. Aaron asked a while back, how do I have time to do this? Well, you make time. You get up two hours early and you do this while you're fresh. And then you go off to save lives, build buildings, and do other great things in the learning process. So give yourself time first. I used to, I don't want to digress too far, but it didn't work out longer term. But I tried to stay up all night and then work during the day and then sleep when I got home from work. So I could learn about the markets and I was at my freshest time. Maybe sleep for sleep until maybe eight or nine o'clock at night, then stay up until the next morning. But anyway, tobacco de jours weighs on the subsectors, and then the subsectors begin to weigh on the sector. So as you look through all these stocks every day, you'll notice that there are quite a few stocks that are just getting torpedoed. And as I said a few weeks ago, something like Teva Pharmaceuticals takes down the subsector. It also weighs upon other stocks within the sector. And the psychology, the sentiment, so to speak, of the market begins to change quickly. And then that weighs on the sectors. And then the sectors obviously weigh on the indices. So it can have a bit of a snowball kind of effect in keeping with that winter is coming theme. Now, these are the same random thoughts that have been in here for weeks, but it's not the end of the world, nor can you see it from here, okay? Now, if we get a weekly signal, if you guys go back to 2015, we had like a weekly signal in the Russell 2000, and it dropped like 18% from there. So the media defines a bear market as a 20% drop or more. So by meteor metrics, it was nearly a bear market, enough to – want to get out of the way of just in case as greg morris says back when he ran five to seven billion dollars however much it was billion here billion there we treat all signals as if they'll become the big one so you do want to take the signals serious now i'm hoping for the best okay i hope this market goes straight up whenever we get bearish people get pissed off okay like family members extended family members that is they'll ask me about the market well, you know, it's starting to look a little iffy in here. Oh, you're always bearish. And they just storm off and get all pissed off. It's like, well, you know, when someone asks for your advice, they're looking for an accomplice, right? I forget who said that, but uh, it's in one of my recent columns. And then it, it, I, on the flip side, when the market's going up, people think I'm always bullish. And that's what a trend follower does. Now, remember that. New highs often begets new highs in a market because everyone's happy. And those who got out because the market was too high may be forced in. OK, and that's what causes sometimes you'll have a parabolic move in a market, an individual stock, especially. Well, that parabolic move is because in addition to short covering and some other things, but a lot of times you just have people can't stand it. They'll just, they'll just buy at any price, jump in. But new highs do put pressure on people to buy. And never forget a market's job is to confuse and confound the most. All right, announcement or two, and then we'll hop into the live charts. Start, um, if you guys want to start uh, typing in some questions. I'm sorry. Uh, well, questions are fine, too. But if you want me to start looking at some individual issues, we'll get ready to hop into the charts. We'll take a, a look at the indices and some sectors, and then we'll look at the, uh, your charts. So once again, it's here. I guess I was here two months ago. But the trading full circle course is live. And you'll probably get it. I was thinking this morning, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to give this course out over the next five years, probably in these weekend charts. Because when I start putting my slides together, I'm always like, oh, you know, I've got a slide for that. Let me go pull it out. <laughs> and that's why you see a lot of the trading full circle slides in, in these presentations. But you could watch the first four videos. I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. Very basic stuff in the first four videos. But it goes a long ways towards either making you successful or coming back to being successful. Maybe you got a little too smart for your own britches. So just go to my website, to trade stocks successfully. And usually you can find it within most of the articles. All right. Let's take a look at the overall market. Some sectors. Yeah, keep the questions coming. 
and we'll uh, nice cap on Donald. Well, that's you know me. I try to stay neutral with all my uh, with any political. I have strong opinions, but I just don't voice them. So, but that's that was his choice to wear the hat. Uh, I started calling him Donald, and he seemed to he seemed to embrace it. All right, let's take a look at the piece. Um, well, first of all, not to pick on this guy on Facebook, but, you know, he's all excited on how much money he made because the market went up. Well, the market is doing a pretty good job of erasing all those gains so far. So S&P 500, fairly serious slide in here and just a little bit of a pullback so far. Now, again, not the end of the world, nor can you see it from here. So let's throw in a 50-day moving average, give us a little reference. Now, as I preach, there's nothing magical about the 50, but it can give you a good point of reference. And what never ceases to amaze me is how simple concepts can work so well in real markets. And one of the concepts I like is what I call daylight. And somebody emailed me and said it's a good name for an IPO pattern I have would call Dave Light. Okay, so... You have Dave Light in here. The lows are greater than the moving average. So you had Dave Light here. You have Dave Light here. It's weird to say it like that, isn't it? Dave Light here and Dave Light here. And now we're back below the moving average, so there is no upside daylight. As a general statement, daylight or Dave Light can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, trade is a little bit more complicated than that. But you'll certainly do a lot better than trying to outsmart the market. But as you can see, we had two tests back here, another test here, another test here, and another test here, and so forth. We survived. Don't get me wrong. The big blue arrow is still pointing higher. And sometimes what appears to be a transition in trend is just a correction in a longer-term trend. But as Greg said, we want to take all signals seriously. Now, the S&Ps haven't officially bow-tied down, I think, just yet. You would actually need a higher high, I think, after this. But you can see they have begun to cross over, and I guess, depending on where we close today, we could actually have a downtrend proper order, meaning that the bow-ties have come together and spread out. It'll be a little bit more obvious in the Russell 2000. I hope this market goes straight back up, okay? And what's the old saying? Hope in one hand and... You know, but pay attention to the net net. So now we're in August. So you go back to June. So that's two months and change. And we've actually lost some momentum. If you're not sure about a market's direction, the first thing I would tell you, and this is all in the trading full circle, of course, is go in and draw a line from today's close or where the close is currently if the market is open. And go back in time, a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, a year, and see what the net-net price change is. And pay careful attention to where the net-net hasn't changed over the last few weeks, a few months, if you're thinking about getting into a market. And as I often preach, if you don't believe me that people don't pay attention to net-net, come to the weekend charts. Now, you probably know what I'll ask about a stock that's going sideways since I warn you. But the net net price change, as you can see, doesn't look so hot. It's actually negative. So you can see that at the least, the S&P has lost some momentum. Now, for perspective, you look at a weekly chart, eh, doesn't look so bad, right? Still in a pretty good uptrend longer term. But it doesn't hurt to be a little cautious, to err on the side of being a little cautious in here. NASDAQ is in the process of forming a bow tie to the downside. And it's nearly there. And this bow tie make more sense once we get to the Russell. And you can see it still looks like it's in a pretty good longer term uptrend. But over the short term, take a look at the net net there, okay? Go back to June also, down a percent since then. So it's lost some steam. And then let's throw that 50 in here. And again, not to beat the dead horse, nothing magical, but it can keep you on the right side of the market. Little test here, 
little test here and little test here. One thing I experimented with mm, quite a bit in years prior is like moving average pivots below price pivots below the moving average or above the moving average for that matter too. But a lot of times you get a little pivot at the moving average, a little test, and then the market takes off again. But you can see NASDAQ could be in the early phases of being in trouble. Let's not get too excited just yet, but let's pay attention. And let's not get too roped into any one decision. Let's not paint ourselves into a corner. Now, here's the bow tie I've been promising. Notice how these moving averages have come together over a very short period of time. Usually, and it doesn't have to fit exactly to the rules, but usually the best ones occur when the moving average crosses over three to four bars. So, and the way you count that is you find the first day where they're all on the opposite side, where the 10 is above the 20 is above the 30, and they begin to come together. And the first day of crossing, you would count. So that's the first day of crossing. That's one, two, so two or three days, and then all of these moving averages crossed over. The other thing I like to look at is if you pay attention to your 50-day simple moving average with these bow tie moving averages, and when they hit them on a strong angle and you have that bow tie form, that's usually a pretty powerful signal that the trend has changed. So your entry would have been around the textbook entry right about here, but I said, eh, about 136.5 would be a pretty good entry on that. And now we're getting a little bit of retrace, and I hope it goes straight back up. I hope this signal turns out to be a false one, but it pays to pay attention. Now, since we're in a Russell, I would become very concerned if we broke down below this range, and it's just human nature. If the market begins to rally up, then it would hit a lot of resistance, a lot of overhead supply. So the longer it stays below that overhead supply and the further it goes below the overhead supply, the more important that overhead supply is. Listening to you, I feel like you had an epiphany in the last couple of years of the 50-day moving average. Whatever where that came from. Well, Phil, I have to give you some credit because you're forcing me to look at it more and more. But I've always looked at the 50-day uh, moving average. One thing I've done some studying on is I think the 50-week moving average in the S&P 500 is pretty amazing. And I think I did that long before I met you. But, yeah, and here's the other thing, too, uh, Phil. And, and truth be told, I have to give you some credit because you, you do – you have opened my eyes to, to looking at it more and more. But if you go back years and years and years ago and you look at older presentations that I've done, you'll notice that there's never, usually never a 50-day moving average or a 200-day moving average on the charts unless the stocks, unless the index is beginning to break down. So I think they only matter when they matter. But one little bit of research I'd encourage you to do is plot a 50-day moving average and then take a look at it on a weekly basis. i got a hidden window here somewhere. That's always the problem of multiple monitors. Let me shut some things down. That's a problem. 50. So a 50 week moving average can be quite interesting. And it's almost as good as a weekly bow tie. So I would encourage you, and this is something I've done a lot of research on. You can see, look at the Dave light in the 2000 bear market. Look at the, I'm sorry, the 2008 bear market. Look at the Dave light in the 2000 bear market. And then as go back in time. And as long as you have daylight or mostly daylight, I mean, look at the run from 1995 all the way up to 1999. What was this? Was that the... Um, Asian crisis, I forget what that was. I think long-term capital was further back. But you can see that something as simple as a moving average can help to keep you on the right side of the market. I wouldn't trade it mechanically, but I certainly would use it. But, yeah, Phil, I'll give you some credit for uh, getting me to plot that more and more. But I do plot it more, again, when the market remains questionable because it can give you a really good pre uh, reference point. Agree on 50, but just use a 200-day moving average versus a 40-week. You could. 
Um, it just takes a little bit noise out, and you're able to see a bigger picture. But yeah, that's fine too. All right, so SP 500 losing steam. Russell sell mode. Some other areas looking a little dubious in here, such as the transports. As you can see, we had to break down a little bit. They bow tied down recently, and quite a few other areas have bow tied down. Take a look at major airs. Okay, a lot of trouble. Look at that bow tie sticking out like a sore thumb there. Uh, manufacturing, kind of sloppy in the bow tie, but obviously you can see has rolled over in here, looking dubious. Some of these areas that have been doing really well, like health services, I wouldn't rush out and short them, but you can see they've lost some steam in here. Material construction, recent bow tie down, that's pretty textbook there. Look at that. You can't get any cleaner than that, it's at least the bow tie is concerned. Now, there's nothing major, there's nothing magical about moving averages. It just helps to illustrate what's already in the chart. So if you took out these moving averages, well, yeah, you could see that this market has made a first thrust down. Okay, it looks like it's in trouble. Same thing with the airlines. Okay, you can see, well, this is a first thrust here. It's had a sharp sell off. But the moving averages kind of help to wake you up that the market may be rolling over. And the beauty is, when you get a case like this where the rollover is fairly gradual, it kind of wakes you up to the fact that, wait a minute, this market has lost steam, could be in trouble. Now, some areas like the semis, I don't see a trade here, but they're failing to get past their prior double top in here. So that's a little concerning. So at the least, most areas have lost steam. Only a few areas like defense looking really good, probably thanks to Mr. Ken, Kim Jong-il. What was his, his dad was, who was ill? Kim Jong-il. And his brother mentally ill. Uh, some selected metals and mining doing okay in here, like aluminium, uh, steel not doing too bad, but still has to get past the prior peak. Some foreign uh, indices are doing okay. Take a look at ETFs when you get a chance there. But I'm not seeing enough to get excited about just yet for a new bull leg. So I would stay cautiously optimistic. Dave, your bow tie system, have you looked at the bow tie in relation to the slope and proximity longer term moving average? For instance, 100 day. Um, I've looked at a little bit of everything over the years. I find the 50 is most useful with the bow tie simply because you get a strong angle, because it's going to cross that 50 a lot of times. If you think about it, you got a 30 day moving average and a 20 day moving average, and it's going to get to that 50 a lot quicker. Than something much longer. And I do like the, um, I like both simple and exponential moving averages. Depends on the case. But when you have something like the, um, this is actually the 100 day you mentioned. But like, let's go back to a 50 just for a second. Or let's throw a 50 in here in addition to it. Let's make it some color we don't have. How about orange? Okay. Now, hopefully it's not getting too busy, but you can see that it's going gonna, it's gonna to cut through that 50 quicker, and that's where your pivot points are usually going to occur. So it kind, of, it kind of makes it stand out a little bit more, and you know that the market's in trouble. It's just a double, double confirmation. And as I often preach, a lot of technicals often come together at the same point. So you can see it all came together right at the 50. Well, it's Phil will tell you when it trades below the 50, it's in trouble. Well, as the bow ties will tell you, when it sells off out of a bow tie, it's in trouble. So a lot of technicals come together. But, no, I really haven't um, paid attention to that longer-term moving average. Other than when the market begins a little to get a little iffy, I will plot a 50 and sometimes even a 200-day moving average. And I think the Russell, last time I checked, was below its 200-day moving average. Now, again, you don't want to trade moving average crossovers or crosses above and below a moving average in and of itself because that could be a very noisy signal. 
but it can tell you when you need to pay attention. And you can see we're now below the 200 day moving average. So that's important. Okay. In the Russell 2000. Steep slope on 100 day bow tie not as relevant. No, no, because actually it would be even more relevant. I, I, I hear what you're saying. And let me get a blank. Let me see if I get a blank screen up to show you the uh, my feeling on that. So Steve's saying that hey, if you got a steep slope in your 200-day moving average or 100-day moving average against the trend, would that signal be less relevant? And I would argue no, because. When a trend turns, if the stronger the prior trend, when the trend turns, the bigger the new trend. Okay, so let me let me see if I can flesh that out. So when this market turns, it probably will be pretty ugly pretty fast because we're in such a long, long, long trend. Now I think it was in thinking fast and slow where they wrote about what you see is all there is. W-Y-S-I-A-T-I. -I. And people who have only experienced the great bear market think the market will go up forever. And again, getting back to these classic books on technical analysis and trading psychology, the reason technical analysis works is because a new bunch comes along every few years, okay? People who think that they found something and it's going to work forever, what you see is all there is. And let's say you get a transitional setup after a very strong trend, and let's just – let's imagine that a moving average looks something like the, the trend itself. Well, when this begins to turn – and let's say you do get that bow tie down. Even though this long, long-term moving average is still headed higher, if this signal begins to work, then the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And on the bottom, it works on the downside too. Like you get a market that bottoms out forever. This is why I like the Phoenix patterns. When people are just accustomed that it's not going anywhere or it's still a longer term downtrend and then it begins to take off, a lot of people get caught off guard. So if you have a strong 100 day moving average, yeah, I mean, that slope of that can help you stay on the right side of the market. But keep in mind that things can change really quick. So I wouldn't I think, if anything, a strong slope would be a positive because if this shorter term transitional setup begins to work, that a lot of people are still of the belief that we're in a longer term uptrend. And like I said, and I've been on panels recently where everybody's still bullish and they say it's just a test. And I'm like, eh, I don't know, guys. You know, maybe you're right, but as a trend follower, I think we're losing some steam in here. And I think we could be in trouble. Hope is okay if you have a plan. I agree, Phil. Wood that has to be banded. What has to be banded should. Hey, good words of wisdom. Yeah, you know, that's that's one of the stories I've come across in the reading, and that was actually in uh, Douglas retold the story. It's been told a thousand times, but there was a floor trader that came off the floor, and he wanted to learn some technical analysis. So he could trade up in his office as opposed to being on the floor. And uh, some young punk kid who had studied technical analysis thoroughly was showing him a chart and says, well, here's support. And it's, it's, it, it will not go through that support. He goes, well, what do you mean? He goes, no, it's support. It, if it goes down to that level, it's not going to go through it because that's where the support is. So the guy says, excuse me, and he picks up the phone. He, he says, um, he calls down to the floor, and he says, um, what would it take to um, to move beans? And the guy's like, nah, I don't know, 5 million bushels. And he says, at the market. And then the market immediately imploded down below that support and kept dropping. And he looked over at the kid and says, and you were saying? So it's a wonderful point 
on on so many so many different levels, you know. Yes, the market should find support, but there's no guarantee that it will at a level. There's a scene in trading places as well. I have to watch that again. That was uh quite interesting. Yeah, Phil, good point there too. Um, Phil's pointing out that we're now testing the 200-day moving average from below, so that could be a tell. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, as I often preach, no matter how many times, no matter how many ways you slice it, a lot of these things all come together at the same point. Donald says we have a Dave Light IPO position, C V N A. From no, I don't see it. C V N A. If anything, looks like we're headed lower in this thing, um, so I would stay away from that. All right, Donald, let's talk about Kim. We are long Kim, uh, FYI, and we've been long Kim since January. This was our – see a little TKO back here? That's where we got long. No, they don't always work out this well. I wish they did. You probably never see my fat ass again. Um, I think Kim would have to pull back a little more. Now I'd like to see it make new highs and then pull back a little more before looking to add to my position or take a new position of itself. So yeah, put it on your momentum list. It looks fantastic longer term, but it's not set up. Steve wants to talk about K. That's going to be a big fat stock. Uh, it's in a downtrend, but it's, it's not any pattern that I trade. It's had a big rally in here. And it's got a lot of support longer term below the market. I just don't think it's worth going after. HV is 16. So there's just nothing for me there. Kite is strong for momentum. Yes, it does. Kite is flying. Uh, on a pullback, quite possibly that might be worth a shot. Always makes me a little nervous to get in these longer-term trends when the market is uh, questionable. Donald says, no stress for me. Good for you, Donald. Frenchy says, the peaches are good. All right, that's good. Low carbonate, so I wouldn't know, at least lately. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a chemical company. It's also foreign. I forget. Is it Chile? Um, I'll have to look at my ETFs. I forget which ones, but there are some ETFs that are rallying in these countries. On a pullback, maybe. Okay. But, yeah, put it on your watch list. Arsene wants to look at uh, Kayla. Yeah, I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback here. Let's put the moving average in and see if we have a signal. Yeah, you would have had a buy signal here. So I guess technically you should be long this one. But it's not set up. But, yeah, you did have a trigger on the, I don't know what we're going to call it, but Dave Landry's Dave Light system. The range is too wide. The range is too wide on on what? Low. Well, here's a company that looks like it could be in trouble. Um, longer term, it's kind of wide and loose. But I hear you. It's broken down. You know, I would almost like to see it get below 66 and then pull back. But it's just kind of wide and loose and all over the place. But, yeah, that's a stock that looks like it could be in trouble. Long or short, I have to say short. JMEI, that's a blast from the past, I think. So here's a case of something that's kind of bottomed out, as you can see, longer term. It's a relatively new issue. Yeah, that looks kind of interesting. My only concern is you only have, like, one big update in here. But that looks pretty good. Um, overhead supply would be a bit of a concern with this one, though. It will have some bad memories along the way. It looks okay. I'd almost prefer if this bottom would have been a little bit longer to put this overhead resistance further back. I think I'd pass just because you've had such an explosion over a day or two. I'd like to see a few more days in that rally. But yeah, I hear you. I mean, it's it certainly look like looks like looks like it turned a corner. I'm sure it's also a bow tie. Yeah, this uh, China Core blood 
has been on my watch list for a while. It's just not giving me an entry. And then today looks kind of like a blow off kind of move, big opening gap reversal. Um, possibly if it made like a big TKO type of move, maybe tomorrow if you see a sell off down to about 10 and a half, then I'd be all over it. Entry above that high and, and stop below that low. So maybe keep an eye out for the next TKO there. The problem with waiting for TKO in a, in a issue is it may never come. And that's why I look at 2,000 stocks a day so I can find the setups as opposed to sitting around waiting for them. But, yeah, put any more minimalist, absolutely, it's on mine. WB, strong momentum. Yeah, uh, this is a Chinese Internet, I think, and they've been on fire. So for me, remember a while back I said it would have to break out and then pull back. So I still believe in that. Step one is done. So, yeah, on a pullback. Pet Q, 220 EMA setup. Ah, you remember that? You've been around for a while then. That was published in 2000 and, or 2000, 19, 1995, I think, or 96. Um, I don't know what's wrong with my scaling on here, but I hear you. Um, it's definitely breaking out the new highs. The range looks a little tight, but there's something wrong with my scaling. Let's see if we can make it. I don't know what's wrong. Is my let's see. I may have worn out yet another keyboard. Uh, yeah, it looks interesting because it's making new highs. So yeah, I hear you. I wish I had. A, I don't have time to go to a, a different chart service. But yeah, I think you could be going to something with that one because it's making new highs. JBHT is gonna be a trucker. Hopefully my chart my charts are effed up now. What happened? Uh, I have to restart uh, TC. I don't know if my keyboard is crapping out on me or what. Yeah, Amazon looks like it's in trouble. We'll take a look at that. And it's it's important. You have to watch everything. But when a market becomes kind of iffy, you want to look at those big names that everybody and their brother is all excited about. Amazon, Apple. What do they call them? The Fang stocks. You know, it's something stupid every time. All right, let's take a look at JBHT first. Uh, like I said last week, mountain of overhead resistance there. So let's leave it alone. I could usually tell by these charts if they're marked up. Somebody asked about them. Amazon could go down. No guarantees in trading. Yeah, you don't even have to say no guarantees. I realize we all realize that here. But Amazon is a bow tie, which triggered right around here. And I think that it could be in a lot of trouble longer term. And I think 800 would be a good... Uh, Next stop on Amazon. So, yeah, absolutely. Amazon in lots of trouble. Good eye on that. Very. Already triggered, though. Um, well, this one's kind of melting up. And I think the best thing you could probably do with this one is technically you will get a buy signal when it closes above this high. And if you wanted to take it, that's fine. But in a case like this, because it's going straight up, I'd almost like to, and I hate to mess up my scaling again because I don't know if I'll get it back, but I'd like to see it break out the new highs and then play a pullback. But, yes, technically you would get a setup on a close above this high, and that technically that, that would be an IPO setup. But I would prefer in this particular case if it went on to make new highs. Don, I can't talk about that one. That's a setup, one of the setups for today, so good, uh, good eye on that. High five, JP. This one's a little thin, but I hear you. It's had a pretty good run in here. I'd almost like to see a little bit more knockout, maybe down towards 10 a little bit. I would pass based on not enough knockout, but I hear you. Longer term, kind of thin, but looks like it's kind of picked up in volume, got some excitement to it. Put it on your momentum list. Absolutely. Apple, of course. Everyone wants to know about Apple. Apple's kind of hanging in there, but there's no pattern for me. Um, you know, I come back to the net-net price change. So net-net, 
as of a couple of days ago. Hasn't done anything in three months. So it'd have to break out and pull back, but I think I'd leave it alone. James, good job on that. That is the stock of the day. Can't talk about it though. Phil knows what it is. With Amazon, I'm seeing surprises in brick and mortar stores like SIG today, turn of the tide. Oh, I don't know. I think online is here to stay, but I hear you. No, nah, I don't know. To me, it seems like the brick and mortar pops are, are temporary at best. NVIDIA. Um, two sideways and too early to short, but certainly has lost some steam, as you can see, by trading sideways. Nothing to trade there. AAL is in a downtrend for sure. Um, on pullbacks, absolutely. But, yeah, stock looks like it's in a lot of trouble. It's not coming off of all-time highs, but close enough. A little wide and loose. But, yeah, on a pullback as a short. Yeah, Howard, I'm actually long that one um, on a Dave Light or a closing high position. So I am long this one. I wouldn't jump in right now, although I'd love it if you did because I am long. But on the next pullback, I think it'd be worthwhile. And this triggered an early IPO pattern that I like to trade, which is in the course. But it also triggered a Dave Light pattern, which I'll show you here. And we're going to probably have to wrap up. I have another webinar after this one. Um, but, yeah, they triggered right here for me. Let's see. One, two, three, four. It triggered right here for me and then – Actually, on that day, too, one, two, three, four, five. It triggered here with a what I call a buy a B pattern, which is an early pattern. And then the following day, it, it triggered with the moving average pattern. So, yeah, on pullbacks, though, let it uh, keep breaking out. ACIA. Well, it's breaking out. Uh, yeah, it could set up. You know, you do have some overhead supply here. It might be worth watching. Yeah, let's let's on follow through and a pullback maybe. Wuba, Wuba's going straight up. Wuba's another one of those Chinese internet companies doing really well. My only concern is most of the rally is in this one big up day. But let's see what happens when it pulls back. Let's see if we can follow through and pull back. Tesla on daily looks like an electrocardiogram, grab, but weekly looks like this TKO trying to recover. All right, let's take a look at that. Tesla. Electric cardiogram, I agree. Well, my only problem, and we might run out of time, but with a TKO, you want to see it uh, trigger. Ideally, with a TKO, this is what you want to see. You have a stock that's headed higher. And then you have your TKO move. Let me try to redraw that. You have a stock that's headed higher. And then you have a TKO move. Ideally, you want to see this TKO trigger sooner rather than later. You want to see it kind of go straight back up and trigger. And that's going to catch the most people off guard. If you have one that does this, and then the market just kind of drifts higher, like it kind of takes a while to get back to that prior little peak like Tesla is doing. I'm less excited about that. So I hear you. Technically, it was a TKO in a weekly, but the fact that it didn't trigger right away, it just sort of drifted higher. That's a little bit of concern. You see the pattern knockout and then drift. So I don't like that pattern. So I would not be I wouldn't get excited about that. But I hear you. Good eye. Howard, you picked my other stock for today. Good job. Can't talk about it. SPB. Okay. We're going to probably have to wrap things up here. Um, yeah, it's in a downtrend, but it's not set up. What I would encourage you to do right now, especially with like the Russell and S&P and 
NASDAQ for that matter, coming off of high levels, is what I encourage you to do is find stocks that look like the overall market that are just beginning to break down from high levels, if you want to short, that is, and short those as opposed to stocks that are already in established downtrends. I think the bigger they are, the harder they fall at this phase of where we are. So I would look for that for opportunities. Well, look, I need to wrap it up. I have another webinar following this one in about 30 minutes. So I need to get ready for that. Uh, and plus, we're out of time anyway. But thank you so much for attending. Any unanswered questions, David, Dave, Lander com. Everyone have a fast, fantastic weekend if we don't talk between now and then. And then hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls here next week. Thank you so much.